This change a little bit with what we're studying. How many know the world's getting darker by the day? And it's time for the remnant, I think, to really learn some things. The three things that God spoke into my spirit right before the last session was fellowship, overcoming, and changing the world. And it can only happen in those three steps. If we try to take it out of order, it's not going to work. And so the last session we dealt with our fellowship with Jesus and with the Father, with the Holy Spirit, with the blood of Jesus, our walking worthy of and in accordance with the blood of Jesus and of the Word of God. You know, the saints of old called it communion with God or practicing the presence of God. And I really believe that we are so surrounded 24-7 by the things of the world and the spirit of this world is increasing that we have got to learn to get into the presence of God and to stay there and learn how to practice his presence while we're at work, while we're driving in the car, while we're at home. We, we, we need to learn to saturate in his presence and to saturate in the word. I was kind of gleaning through a book that, uh, that uh, I picked up for next to nothing on uh, Logos this week. And just kind of breeze through it just a little bit to say, well, I'm going to read that as soon as I get through with all the other research I'm doing. And one of the things that really jumped out to me, he said, he said, our, our, our problem for believers is not really a sin problem. And I thought, okay, where are you headed with this? And he goes on to say, it's a word problem. That if we'd stay enough time in the word, in the life of the believer, it would kill the sin in his life. And for so many of us, it seems like what's going on in the world seems to be overwhelming. But may I present to you what I'm feeling in my spirit this morning. It is not a problem of darkness. It's a problem of not turning up the light. And I want to get this morning on that the greater one is on the inside of us. I don't care how dark it gets. The only one that I've ever been able to find out could cause darkness so great that light wouldn't shine was Almighty God when he was judging Egypt. The devil does not have that power. That no matter how dark it is, if you turn up the light, darkness always flees. And somehow or another in America, we have forgotten that. We have forgotten that in our own life. We were sharing this morning that sometimes you, you'll go shopping, you go out into public, and you can feel such oppression that you just want to run. I've been there. I've done that. But I've also, there have been times that all of a sudden something rose up on the inside of me and I said, I'm not going to take that now in the name of Jesus. I bind you up. I'm not leaving. You're leaving. We need to learn to have that faith of the greater one is on the inside of us and know who we are in Christ because I have been fellowshipping with him. I've been fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. I've been fellowshipping in this word and I begin to find out who I am in him and I get to the place where I can say, I'm not going to take that anymore. And so if you have your Bibles this morning, I want to go to 1 John chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. You know, as, as I was just sharing that, I was thinking about the prophecy in Isaiah where it talks about how that there's going to become darkness on the earth, gross darkness like has never before seen. And yet God says that with one breath and the next breath he says, but your light has come. You see, the darker it gets, the, the more opportunity we have to shine for Christ. We can allow his power to shine through us. And so the Apostle John is dealing with the rise of the Antichrist. He's dealing with so many things in 1 John. Yet he stops and says this, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Underline that in your Bible. It doesn't say, I felt like doing that. If I'm of God, if I have been washed in the blood of Christ, if I'm in fellowship with him, I have overcome whether I feel like it or not. I have overcome whether the circumstances makes me believe that I have overcome it or not. I know many times I have, 
And we always see this in, in cinematic view that all of a sudden it's, it's like Rocky. He's getting beat and he's getting beat and he's getting beat, but yet there's an overcomer on the inside of him. And there's this point that turns that you can see it turn in his face. And it's like, I have had just about enough of that. And he commences to whooping the enemy. You see, the beating that he was receiving was not the truth. The truth was there was an overcomer waiting just to stand up. And within the remnant, there is an overcomer just waiting to stand up, but we have been believing the lies of the devil that we can't do anything. We have also believed many of his lives, many of his lies that have actually disconnected us from the power that we need to stand up. And I think what God is doing with this series is he's saying, listen, reconnect to the power. We need, we need to discard the lies the enemy is saying about we need to leave the commandments of God behind. And I'm going to share more on that just in a minute. But listen what he says here. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Greater is the spirit of God that's within you than the spirit of of the world. There is a spirit that is controlling every Babylonian world system. It's the counterfeit to the Holy Spirit, but the greater one lives on the inside of you. He goes on to say, they are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And guys, can I be real honest with you? I have been speaking to believers that say that they're believers that don't hear me. Have you ever tried to open up the Word of God and talk to somebody that claims to go to church? And the minute you get the minute you get one toe into the kiddie pool, I'm not talking about going into the deep things of God. The moment you get them into the kiddie pool, they cannot understand you. They're not of God. They are a sino, a Christian in name only. They have no depth. They have no understanding. They'll tune in to whatever the world says, but they have absolutely no comprehension. On the other hand, I got, I got an email this week from a, a student that began getting into, you know, Jesus said, you know, quoted Psalms uh, 82, we are gods. And so you said, you know, the devil's promise was to make us gods and, and we're not supposed to be gods. And what was that? And so I opened up a huge thing of, of Dr. Michael Heisler and all this stuff and the dynamic that was going on, how the rabbis perverted that and said, just like how the, the, this divine council was set by God to rule, we, and we in a sense have the same position and now we're going to be judged by God for it. And, and the dynamic that they were getting mad at Jesus for calling himself a son of God, but they were calling themselves sons of God because they were rulers when the very judge that's head of the council was standing in front of them. And so I, I open up this, this whole thing of, of, of deep Hebraic stuff. And you know what his response was? Thank you for sharing that. I really have a lot to chew on now. You see, with a believer, when you speak truth to them, it may be way over their head, but they're saying, you know what? That's the biggest piece of steak I've ever seen in my life, but I, I, may, I may have to cut that thing down, get some A1 sauce, but you know what? I'm going to devour that. I'm going to study that out because I can sense the Spirit of God is in that instead of going, huh, I'm, I'm, well, that's not what my preacher preaches. Who cares? He's going to be judged by God for what he preaches and what he doesn't preach. But those that are the Spirit of God, you can, I, guys, I, I have, like, like, like with Dr. Michael Heisler, he, he has a Ph.D. in Semitic languages, not just Hebrew, all Semitic languages. So and with what I know about Hebrew, he can clear his throat and leave me in the dust. And so he's getting in, in, into some stuff and some nuances within Hebrew that absolutely twist my brain into a knot. But at the same time, my spirit is saying, listen to this, there's something to it. There's something that, you're, that if you're not careful, you're going to miss. Because I, since I am of, of the kingdom of God, and he is at the kingdom of God, even though he's at a higher place linguistically than I am, the spirit of God on the inside of me causes me to begin putting that together, and I begin hearing it. But if you're sitting with someone who calls themselves a believer, and you open up the word, and they can't hear what you're saying then the only thing that they're really going to be able to hear is you're a sinner. You've not really repented. You've joined 
a country club that happens to meet on Sunday morning. And God doesn't care about that little card that you have membership card in that church because the Holy Spirit in you is not witnessing what the Holy Spirit is saying in me. Let's just get real. I do agree with John MacArthur that one of the biggest problems in, in the body of Christ is about 90% of them aren't saved. That's why we're, ha we're going to see the Christian versus Christian war coming that Dr. Horn's talking about. The religious Christians are going to go with whatever the religious flow is that religious spirit begins to, to bring them into, and it's not going to work. You know, why is it that the world doesn't hear us? If the Holy Spirit's speaking through you, that's an unusual voice. Come on now. They have, ever since they were born, they have had fellowship with this other spirit. Everything from government to commercials to friends at school, everything is encompassing, and that thing has an anointing to carry you on into sin. They understand that, but it's another voice that they're unfamiliar with. Now, we as believers, now here, here's the conundrum for us as believers. We know the spirit of the world really well. Because just like them, we were born into it, we listened to it, we were programmed to listen to it on television, on radio, in the movies, in school, everything. And then one day, Almighty God intrudes into our life and we start hearing another voice. And it says, you know what, you ugly thing, you're wrong with God and your sin is as black as the pitch of night. And it's going to send you to a devil's hell. You better listen to the gospel. And now for us that are born again, we hear both voices. And one of the hardest struggles for Christians is how to turn out the one that you so easily have been influenced to your whole life and learn to tune into an unfamiliar yet now welcoming voice because you're now born of God. It's like, e e even though I feel like I should be listening to you, but there's still this luring, this siren's control of the other, and there's this dichotomy that you've got to fight. But once you get to where you can really tune into the Holy Spirit, this other voice becomes repugnant to you. You start seeing the darkness that it, that is of it. And so we have that challenge before us. Guys, it's imperative that we tune out the voice of this world and tune only into the voice of the Holy Spirit in the last days. Because that other spirit, if you confess that you're a believer, is all about destroying you, killing you, pulling you into sin, and disgracing the gospel. Whereas the Holy Spirit is about empowering you, putting you in the right position at the right time for the miracle of God. If you've ever dealt with electricity... Because I, I think we, we, we see this uh, a lot of times. We, we can see things in physics or things in the natural realm that explain the spirit realm. Have you ever seen where you're, you're trying to run electricity, but the circuit isn't completing, and so the full power doesn't flow? The more I listen to the spirit of the world, the more I am out of line with the circuitry of heaven. The more I tune out of that voice and tune into God, the, the circuitry begins to be established where the power of God can flow more. And I think that's why God is calling us into fellowship to get everything aligned and connected so that he can flow through us the way that he needs to. We need to, and the Holy Spirit is very generous. He's very gentle. He's not going to force you to do anything, but the spirit of this world is hypnotic. The Holy Spirit will never get you into a daze. He actually causes you to be more alert. But the spirit of this world gets you into some hypnotic daze that you're not even thinking anymore. You're just going by what he tells you. But we need to learn to fellowship with the Holy Spirit enough to learn his voice and then to have confidence in who he is in you. The king of the universe, the one who simply spoke and created everything by the power of his word. And I just read this week with all that they're doing at the CERN Collider, you know, besides trying to rip a hole in, in time and space, <laughs> you know, and trying to disprove God. Every time they think, I have finally been able to disprove God, they came to this conclusion. The universe, you know, the, there was a moment that they say the Big Bang happened and nothing became everything. They said it should have winked out of existence within a few milliseconds. But yet here we are. 
How many know the, the universe is a little bit older than a few milliseconds? The only reason it is is because everything is upheld by the word of his power. So the, the more that they collide things together and trying to disprove and trying to find the God molecule, it's not a molecule. He is a person, and he gave a word, and therefore this universe is in existence. And everything that he created, including the scientists that are trying to disprove him, must give an account to him for their lives and what they've done. That's the greater one that's living on the inside of us. We need to learn to have, have confidence. And I think what the Holy Spirit's getting ready to do is to begin to school us, to set us up for little things where we have a choice of listening to the world or listening to him. And when we listen to him, we'll get a little victory. Confidence is not built overnight. It has to be built over an extended period of time. It's like a child when he's first learning how to ride a bike. You don't send him down the biggest hill that there is. You send him on a very flat place, and he learns how to get his balance, and he begins to get more, more confidence and more confidence and more confidence, and then eventually they'll get to the place where mom can no longer look at them playing on their bikes because her hair will be standing ext- all the way up, especially if it's boys, because sometimes they get a little bit more confidence than they should have, and they get to doing tricks and everything else. Because they have confidence in what they can do. And the same time, every time we get in a situation that the Holy Spirit says, listen to me or you listen to the devil, listen to me or listen to the devil. Every time we choose him and we, and we overcome, he's building our confidence. He's building our confidence. If you have a lot of building confidences, you don't want to start out with, if you're the son of God, let me walk on the water. How many know that wasn't at the beginning of the ministry with Jesus? That was after they had healed some sick and after there was already a lot of this evidence that Jesus was Messiah before Peter got to that crux. You don't start out saying, I wonder who you are, but if you really are, bid me come on the water, you're fixing to drown. God, because he loves us, will give us a series of things to develop the confidence that we have in him. Let's go on here in 1 John 4, 14 through 17. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. Let me say that again. God dwells in him and he in God. If we really do this thing right, the devil has a harder time getting to you because God's lost in you and you're lost in God. I'm in him But at the same time, he's in me, and so the devil's got to go through God to get to me if I stay where I'm supposed to be. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and that he that that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. Now let me take this apart. Abiding in love, one of the things I, 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 had been, I was taught years and years ago was the love walk of walking in love. But they didn't bring in the full account of who God is in that understanding of the love walk, and they completely left out the commandments of God in that walk, which later on we're going to find, and even in the study this morning, that I prove my love to God or I show my love to God by keeping his commandments. If you don't bring Bring that in and having a balanced approach of God, you get this, this old kumbaya, everybody's fuzzy, everybody's wonderful time of love. I mean, no, that's not it. The Bible says to love God is to hate or to eschew evil. But if I understand his love for me, his love for you, that, that he knows exactly where you are. He knows what you're going through. And he has already put provisions in his word not only to guide you through the landmines of life. And how many know life is filled with landmines every single day? The way that I see people drive anymore, just getting on the road to go to work, you are taking your life into your own hands. Very few people even bother to look at the road anymore because they're too busy doing things on the phone. Just in the, in the last month, I have kept myself out of two wrecks because I listened to the Holy Spirit. One of them, I had the green light, and I started to go, and the Holy Spirit said, wait a minute. So I, I kind of let off the gas, and about that time, a woman blew through. Uh, she had a red light at least for 30 seconds to a minute before she even got to the intersection. Blew through because she was too busy talking on her phone. 
little things like that, if you hear God and God does little things like that, we realize that how much we, we take our lives into our own hands unless we're following the Spirit of God. We can negotiate the landmines of life because God loves us. God already went there before us, and he has prepared a way for for us in these last days. And so if I abide in that love and I'm dwelling in that love and dwelling in him, I begin to have more confidence that he's gonna take care of me. Let me tell you something. One of the things I have found out, and this, this may be just indicative to Mike Lake. God's love is greater than Mike Lake's stupidity at times. That I have been stuck on stupid a few times, and to my my amazement and, and, and Mary's double amazement, God gets me through it. And both of us, after it's over, you know, I'm saying, dear Lord, don't l- l- ever let me be that stupid again. And Mary said, I don't know how you survived that thing. Because, because it was God's love for me. Because, because I set my love on him, and he has set his love on me. He knows I'm not perfect and that I can get off. But if I have confidence in his love, if I have confidence in that relationship, it will cause me to overcome. Because although my head was wrong, my heart was right. We see that in the life of Abraham. We see that in the life of other people in the Word of God. And they had absolute belief in the love of God. And I'm the one that's in covenant with God, not the guy down the street that's walking with the devil. I have covenant, and the blood of Jesus is even great enough to to overcome my accidental sins. It's when I get into willful sin that I overstep and I step out of the blood of Jesus that I become a moving target. But listen, he said this is where we can have boldness in the day of judgment. And I thought, I want to take this apart because whenever the Bible talks about the day of judgment, how many know that comes to reckoning time? When Jesus comes back and all hell is breaking loose, you read the book of Revelation, all the hell is breaking loose, that the judgment of God is being poured out. I see, I see something very interesting. God says, go mark those that belong to me. And while fire and brimstone and everything else is, is falling and collapsing on the world around them, it is not touching them. This Greek word here for boldness means to say the same as another, but if you, if you go down a little bit in its definitions, I love this, to declare openly, to speak freely, to press, to profess oneself the worshiper of one, to praise and to celebrate. In the day of judgment, I I can profess my belief in Jesus of Nazareth while everybody else is shaking their fists at him saying, how dare him come back and judge? I'm saying, come on, Lord Jesus. Let him have it. I'm ready. Come on. I'm a worshiper of you. I belong to you. Your name is upon me. Your spirit is in me. I'm covered in your blood. I don't have to fear judgment. And there's boldness. Well, brother, are you saying we're going to go through the tribulation period? I am saying everyone has tribulated since the beginning of time. I don't know how far it's going to get for us because I see something that when I examine the eschatological position of pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib, on all three sides I have also discovered intellectual dishonesty where they twist things to make it fit what they want. So I, like many others, say, I am a panda millennial. This is going to pan out just like God said. I don't have to understand it. All I've got to be is ready when he comes back. And I'm going to go through, if God wants me to go through the entire tribulation period because we have misinterpreted, I have got to begin developing some spiritual strength of confidence of who I am in him and who he is in me and confidence in this blood covenant because the word promises me that I can have boldness in that day when he judges the earth. The Bible says the righteous are bold as a lion when the wicked chase when there's nobody, flees when no one's even chasing them. It's time for us to have a backbone in the body of Christ. And the only way to get a backbone is to have confidence in who he is in you and get a picture of the real and right Jesus. Actually, that was the word confess that I just got real happy about. The word bold means free and fearless, confident, cheerful, courage, boldness, and assurance. How would you like to have that when God's judging the world? See what happens? You get so happy preaching. I grabbed the wrong Greek word. Guys, we need to learn how to get bold in Christ. 
And I'm not talking about the irritating, fake, religious bolding that, that some people equate obnoxious with bold. You don't see the, any of the apostles doing that. But they could hold their ground in what they believe. Let's go on here to 1 John 5, verses 1 through 5. Because this is talking about you. If you've made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life, and you're not a Christian name only, but you have actually really repented of your sins and come under that blood, this is talking about you. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the real and only true Messiah, is born of God, and everyone uh, that loveth him is begotten that begotteth loveth him also that is begotten of him. And guys, let me, let me, can I, can I just, for a moment. There are a lot of people that say they're Christians. I have a hard time loving. You know why? They're not. They're not. When you really start walking with God, the, the quickest thing to irritate your spirit is a religious spirit pretending to be the Holy Spirit. There, I, I have had some situations where if, if now if uh, Brother Rodhouse will, will tell you, know, I've had people stop by, I've had people call, if, if they're really trying and, and they're walking with God and they're really his, I'll, I'll empty the shelves to try to get them information that they need. I'll do whatever I need to. But here lately, I have been having a bad case of wanting to bop heads. Because it was a religious spirit, and that religious spirit was getting mad at me. How come this doesn't work? Because you're not of God, nitwit. Repent. God doesn't care how many times you've been baptized or how many churches you belong to. You have never given your heart to him. You use him as a crutch instead of submitting to him as a Lord. And I want to bop head so bad sometimes. You know why? They're making him look bad. I don't care about me. But don't... Don't serve another spirit and say you're serving God and then go around telling people this doesn't work and why is God allowing this and why is God allowing that when you're not even walking with him. I hate that with a passion. Why? Because I love him. But if I have someone that really is trying to walk with him and really loving him, I almost have infinite patience for them. I no longer have infinite patience for religious spirits. They nauseate me. Because they're going to fall right in line with the Antichrist when he comes. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Oh. I mean, isn't that warm, fuzzy kind of love? You just, everything goes. Somehow believers have gotten the impression that walking in the love of God is like guys that are on the beach smoking dope. They just end up getting in love with everybody. You see, I've been in the military. I have seen guys stoned. I've seen drunks that get violent, but I've seen guys stoned, you know. And the MP is cuffing them, and they're saying, I love you, man. How many know that kind of love just isn't quite right? And they usually feel the need to love every person around them a little more than they should. The love of God causes me to love truth. And there's a lot of alignment going on right now that I'm seeing that we're having predominant men in the Protestant movement begin lining themselves up with Rome, talking about oneness and love. I cannot do that because it's not of God. I'll just go, I may make a lot of people, it's not of God. And I've got, I've got almost 1,800 years of history to prove it. It's not of God. Therefore, I cannot call them brothers. Because if they were brothers, they would be a part of something else. I know too much about the esoteric and too much about the occult to look at that and not see it just oozing out of every pore. And I love the commandments of God. Why is that? Why, well, Mike, why are you so emphatic about the commandments of God? Because everything of the world is dismissing the commandments of God. You see, here's a problem. You can't say God is against homosexuality, which is a commandment, 
right? It's a commandment. And eat pork and do all the other things that God says not to do. We preach that God has delivered us from the commandments of God, and yet then we turn to the gay and lesbian and say, oh, but yours because I don't like it. You're a hypocrite. In fact, I watched the national debate that there, there was this minister debating with some apologists from, from the gay and lesbian community, and he said, well, that violates the commandments of God. The guy says, you eat pork. Uh, well, that one really isn't necessarily, but well, show me in the Bible. I could look at the guy and say, don't commit adultery, don't eat pork. Keep the feast. Don't do Christmas and Easter because it's not in the Bible. I do the commandments. Now what's your problem? You see how quickly they disarm it? Because everything, the spirit of this world has been working on the church to disarm it, so we have abandoned the commandments of God, which are the tap, which ta- the commandments of God keep you from stepping on the landmines. They position you for blessing. They keep you out of trouble. And they are proof to both the world and to heaven that I'm walking with God. It's not about getting saved. It's about this is how somebody who is saved walks. And if you don't walk that way, you're not saved because you love God. This is how we show our love for God. We keep his commandments for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Keeping the commandments are easy. Man can make them hard. Rabbis can really make them hard. I, I've, got a, I've got an entire series called The Daily Dose of Torah. And my, my big problem, I, I've got the entire series, all 16 volumes. My problem was there was a little, maybe a little dab of Torah about every other volume. To look at the extent of what they won't do to violate the Sabbath instead of dishonoring God and keeping the Sabbath, it's almost mind-twisting as well as the, the mental gymnastics to get around what you want to do when you want to do it, but the way that you have taught it won't let you do it, even though it's not in the Word of God. And so you go around this loop, not this loop, and down this loop, and over here to get it done. That's grievous. But when God says don't, that means don't. Now, this is about as deep theology as I can possibly get. When God says don't, don't. When God says do, do. Don't argue with the do's and don't violate the don'ts. Because many times in the kingdom of God, the only time you really understand the wisdom of it is later on down the road after you've been doing all the do's. I mean, I can testify of that. Here's one I've been cooking on. Why is it that God doesn't want us to eat pork? Well, number one, besides pork being uh, holy in all pagan religions, I believe it's also holy in the transhumanist movement because it'll end up being a conduit for gene splicing. God says, because it all goes back to Genesis chapter 6. I think there's an element in there with that. In fact, I was listening to one guy says, you know, we, we, we have these cattle that have a human, a human immune system so they can create medicine, but we had to do it with this and then cross it with a pig and then went from a pig to a guinea pig to, to a rabbit to a, I don't know what, it was like four or five steps to get it to where you could accept this and embed a human, a human immune system within a cow. How many know a cow doesn't need a human immune system? Probably a cow system would work a whole lot better for it because that's the way God made it. But see, the blending of some of these things, and I think that, though they they tell us that pig is probably the closest thing to the human physiology that we can get. I do know that from what I understand from Scripture that demons can inhabit it the same way they would. In fact, they they prefer it in many instances because the spirit of filth can be so easily manifested there and nobody thinks anything of of it. That's just that's just strong, and I'm still kind of brewing that one out. But as I, I think as I begin to take apart what they're doing gene splicing, I'm going to see the common link of using pig DNA. And God says, because of what they did in Genesis 6, don't even mess with it. I'm drawing a line in the sand. I don't want you to ever identify with that. Don't let it be in your system. And now we have people, when they have heart, when they have heart surgery, they're having uh, pig um, valves, uh, 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 aors put into them. Uh, let that not be so. And one of the things we're also seeing in society is an absolute turning against against anything that remotely is a commandment of God, even if the two things you're embracing are diametrically opposed. This has been a conundrum for me in just watching the left is because they promote the gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans, trans 
gender, transhumanist, transgender, trans something, or trans fat agenda. At the same time, why? Because that violates what God has said about our sexuality right here. At the same time, they're embracing Islam. While our kids can't pray in the name of Jesus in school, they're, a, they're actually able, they're, they're teaching them how to pray Islamic prayers in school now. If that was a Christian coming in and doing it, there, there would be people show up with guns and riot gear and everything else. But yet, when you look at as Islam is rising, you have the gay, lesbian, uh, transgender, all this stuff rising up, and you have the other. This one over here, their scriptures say, not only do you call it sin, you kill them. That's what their scriptures say. And these guys are all about killing these guys that you're lifting both of them up. You know what they're doing? Uh, the, right now, the elite is positioning Islam to become an ascension. And so when this other movement comes up, they're lifting them up so that all their heads can be cut off first. And the very movement that's using both sides to get a power, it, it, it's, it's, not, it's not just to get votes. They're going to rally themselves against anything that's against this and against the commandments of God. And then we have preachers preaching against the commandments of God. Well, you might as well go ahead and join those other people because you're in the same boat and you're preaching by the same spirit. I show my love for him in the last days, in the last book, most likely written in the New Testament. 30 years after Paul finished all his writings, I show my love for God because I've been saved by keeping his commandments. And that's going to be essential in the end of days. Guys, we have the contrast right now. The spirit of the world denies that Jesus is almighty God come in the flesh. They deny the commandments of God, thus deny any responsibility to answering to him for their lives. Right now, they're shaking their fists and saying, we're going to become gods ourselves. We don't need to answer to you. Well, the believer, the Spirit of God, proclaims that Jesus is Almighty God come in the flesh, proclaims the truth of heaven, hell, and the Gospels. How many know heaven is real, hell is real, sin is real? And when you get saved, there is a transformation. You go from bad, ugly darkness to light. You go, there, there is this transformation. So if you went to church, there's no transformation, you didn't get saved. There has to be a transformative power to it, or it's not the gospel. The Spirit of God claims to redeem, express their love for God by keeping his commandments and declaring that Jesus will return to judge the lives of men according to his word. And the more I begin aligning myself to that, the more I can align myself to the power of God. Mary and I have been sitting and talking because, guys, there, there have been some things that people have been calling the power of God. And you guys know me well enough to know that I've also been around the occult trying to move more. It's like a, it's a Geiger counter. It's like, -da 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 -da. Well, that ain't of God. There's a lot of things right now that people are claiming is the power of God in services, and it's all esoteric knowledge. There's a phenomenon with, with, within demonology that we see like with uh, the French Revolution, that they call it the, the manifestation of the Gregories, that you have demons flowing here that are in line with principalities doing things, and all of a sudden it begins to sweep over the people, and there's a power, and it takes a life of its own, and it can do miracles, it can do all kinds of things. At the same time, it can get society to do some of the most heinous things. Uh, our, our forefathers here in America were, were revolted by what was called the French Revolution, they said they were just a bunch of ungodly pagans doing what they were doing. It, it, even, even the Masons over here said it was bad. But it was the Masons over in Europe that got it done in French Freemasonry. That, that, that's that Gregory spirit, and we're going to see that. And you can get that going in a service on emotion, a lot of other things, that will take a life and a power of its own. And just because there's a miracle doesn't mean it was of God. But what, we're, what I have seen is there are, there are times there are ebbs and flows to the power of God where God will actually draw back to see what you'll do. Will you keep his commandments and walk with him even though you don't see anything right now? But we, what we haven't realized, if, if it, go on YouTube and, and watch. We have, we've had tsunamis the last few years. Watch what happens on the beach right before a tsunami hits. 
or even the tide is pulled way, way back offshore, and then it returns as a tsunami wave. We're getting ready to see that with the power of God in the days ahead, that God has been drawing back to release something to move forward, and those of us that have been stayed faithful, even when we didn't see anything, we stayed true to this word, we're going to start seeing miracles. And God is saying, listen, I want to build your confidence. Learn who you are in me. Learn who I am in you. Learn about my covenant. Learn to have fellowship with me so that when the spirit of this world comes in on you, then like a flood, the Holy Spirit can lift up a standard against it in you to push it back. That is where we're headed. Let's go on. Let's, let's see what it says here in 1 John 3 and 22. Why am I going to get my prayers answered? Well, because I ended it with in Jesus' name. I got God in a headlock. He's got to answer me. It's all about confidence. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. What I have found out is when I'm walking in sin, even if my head no longer tells me it is sin because the preacher told me so, your spirit knows. And so here you're getting ready to stand against the devil that you've been playing footsies with all week because of what you've been doing. And you try to pray and to bind him and to push him back, and your spirit goes, I got no confidence in that. Not with the way I've been living. No, no, you wouldn't listen to me. You keep listening to your head. You listen to everybody but the Spirit of God within you, and you spend most of your time trying to disqualify the Word of God instead of getting in there finding out what God says. Now you think you're going to be able to move in the power of God? Ah, your, your own heart backs off and says, ah, I don't know if I can do this. But when you've done right, have you ever seen a, a, a small child that, I mean, they, they did exactly what mom and dad said. I mean, they got the rooms clean. They got everything just right. And now it's time to ask for the prize. They got confidence. It's not saying, oh, mom and dad, I know I didn't do this. I know I didn't do that. But, but, but please give it to me. Please, 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 please. No, they, they come in with what? Boldness. Mom, dad. I got it done. Come check out my room. Come check out all this stuff. I got all my toys put up. I got every. I got all my homework done. Now it's time for the movie. Break out the popcorn because it's time to claim the promise because I did what I was supposed to do. That's confidence. And mom and dad, it would be unjust for you not to break out the movie and to break out the popcorn and probably throw in some candy in there too because they did it all. Now, if we have that inclination within us, how more does God have that same inclination? But our problem in spiritual warfare is that our theology is so messed up, we're playing on the devil's side of the line all day long and then think that we can step over this side of the line when we need to and push him back. You don't have confidence from your heart. That's one of the reasons your prayer doesn't go past your chin is because you've not been obedient in the kingdom. Now you're expecting the devil's kingdom to be obedient to the kingdom in you when you're not even obedient to the kingdom within you. But when you can say, you know what? I've done exactly what God's told me to do. I've fellowshiped with him. I made sure everything was under the blood. I've kept God's commandments. I, when I even found out that pig I wasn't supposed to eat, even though bacon is its own food group and nothing on the planet tastes better than crispy bacon, I will give it up because God said to give it up. If the cross was the measure of sacrificing, I can sacrifice my love for bacon and I can give it up to him. Now, devil, what you got on me? I've been obedient even when I didn't want to, even, even when my flesh didn't want to. I've done everything that God says. Now there's a boldness on the inside of me that I can say, you know what, devil, you back off. This is my place. This is my home. This is my family. This is my life that I'm walking with God. How dare you intrude on it? Can you see the boldness that raises up? That's what the apostle John is talking about. I don't listen to the hypnotic song of the devil and get mesmerized by it. I get sickened by it. And finally say, you know what, just shut that stuff up around me. Now, when I'm not here, I, don't, I, I can't control what you do, but now that I'm here, you shut that down and you shut it down now because the kingdom of God came into this place when I walked into this place. The greater one lives on the inside of me. And he has empowered me whatsoever I bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever I loose on earth I, I, is loosed in heaven. And I bind this up in earth right now. You don't have a right to do that around me. Now let's jump over to 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. 
This is the confidence that we have of him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Well, what's according to his will? His word. He gave it in black and white. I'm walking in his word. I'm walking in fellowship with him. And now, and now, now, not only do I know that if I'm walking in his commandments, I get my prayers answered. Now those commandments and that fellowship are beginning to mold what I ask in prayer. And it's according to his will. And if I know it's according to his will, he hears us. I love verse 15. And if, he hear, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desired him. Not hope one day it will get done. But I know that I know. I know so much now I don't even need to see it manifested right now. I know it's a done deal. Because all he has to do is say a word. You see, I think this is part of... Uh, what. How many know evil over land can open up demonic portals to hell over the land? I'm, I'm getting into some other things right now. But when a nation leaves God, it opens up a portal to hell that all this stuff begins to pour. How was Daniel able to live in Babylon and not get affected? How was Abraham, he was surrounded by pagans everywhere he went. His walk with God and his obedience to the commandments of God created a, a, a portal of heaven right over him that heaven poured out even when he messed up and went down to Egypt. You want to talk about being, you know, being in a bad place. God started cursing the Pharaoh because he started messing with Abraham. That's having that open window. I just use the term portal to get your attention. But you know, when you're standing under a shower of blessing, it's kind of hard for mud to cling on to you. If you're standing under a place that heaven is, is uh, light, you're, you're standing under a spotlight, it's hard for darkness to get around you. That's what this is talking about. That if I'm walking with him and fellowshipping with him and I'm keeping his commandments, I have this open window of heaven that the light of God is able to shine around me and I'm not the one that has to dispel the darkness. The kingdom of God being manifested in me begins to dispel this darkness. What I've got to do is stay under the light and don't walk off into darkness. That's how we start changing the world. We can't do it with, with easy slogans. We can't, we can't do it with jokes. We can't. The only thing that's going to do it is a life that is holy, a life that is hidden in God. I heard a quote this week that I thought was really interesting. There was, there was a Catholic uh, queen called Bloody Mary that she had no problem killing Protestants from one end of England to the other. But there's one guy. He was a man of prayer. His name was John Knox. She confessed that she feared his prayers more than an approaching army. <laughs> John Knox found the secret of being of the hiding place in God. She feared most him saying, Daddy, look what she's doing. I would like it changed, please. Time for her to have a bad day. Time for her to be judged. She feared that. Well, if that could be happening in the midst of what was going on then in England, that all, if you confessed faith in Jesus rather than the Catholic Church, it was an instant death sentence. That's how bad it was. And yet this one that was pouring out all this Catholic wrath on the Protestant movement feared one Protestant man. Hell is afraid you're going to get a hold of this. It will do everything to get you to dismiss it in your life because if you walk in this, there will be people in the elite that will fear your prayers. There will be people in government that fear your prayers. One of the reasons why the elite are able to get what they're getting done right now in America is there's no real prayer life in the church. We are playing church. They have created some pseudo thing that we call church that has divorced us from the blood of Jesus, has divorced us from repentance, and has divorced us from the commandments of God. And therefore, all we're doing is beating the wind and thinking we're having church. First John is the key to reverse this trend. And God is calling us to it. 
Well, Father, I thank you for your word today. Father, I ask that you would cause a, that the Holy Spirit would become a drill sergeant in our life to begin instructing us in the weapons of our warfare, to begin calling us to prayer. Father, let us begin to know seasons of prayer that, that we lose the track of time because we were simply with you. And Father, let your commandments become precious to us. And Father, let us always be cognizant of every time that we do the word, we're building one more step into victory in our lives. And Father, let the remnant raise up with absolute boldness and absolute confidence in you and who you are in us. Father, I thank you and I praise you for it. In Jesus' name.